What's going on, everybody? It's a brand new episode of Off Book presented to you by Broadway Black. We're ready to hit our mark and we're ready to do it right now. My name is Drew Shade and I am here with Namir Smallwood and John Michael Hill from the play Passover, the first play to hit the Broadway stage since the pandemic. And we are excited about it. We are excited to dive into this piece, into these two artists. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you all doing today? Doing great, man. How are you? I'm alive. I'm breathing on schedule. That's my main thing that I say all the time, that I'm breathing on schedule because that's all we can ask for, right? Love um, that. That's the that's the main thing. So that that sort of pumps me up and it pumps other people up too in the meantime too. So um, I'm glad that you two are breathing on schedule. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely. Hey, we love to hear. Uh, gentlemen, I first must start out by saying that I have to give you so many praises and, and applause uh, for the work that you're doing in Passover. Passover is a, a tough piece, it feels as, as though, even sitting in the audience, it feels like a tough piece. And to see the way you two play off of each other and the brotherly love that you all develop on that stage night after night is absolutely phenomenal. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how did you get here? I want to start with you, John. John, you've been on Broadway before. Uh, 2010, you were nominated for a Tony. Talk to me about your your trajectory to this particular point and coming back to Broadway. Wow, I'm gonna try not to <laughs> take us too too much time. With this no, trajectory. take take all the time you need. It's your story, brother. We want to hear. We want to know more about you. John Michael Hill was was on Broadway in 2010 with Superior Donuts. He was nominated for Best Supporting Actor um, in a play. So uh, that that was a, a wild time. I had just sort of gotten out of undergrad at University of Illinois in Champaign. While I was there, I did my first play at Steppenwolf in Chicago. And mm. it just happened to be at a time when they were hoping to bring in some um, new blood. And I showed up, did my thing with Anna Shapiro in the Bruce Norris play. And they asked me to join the company shortly after. So when I graduated, that was sort of my artistic home and got you know hooked up with Tracy Letts and he he had just done August Osage and was writing Superior Donuts and that that was the first show that you know I transferred with ever and uh to be a part of that team was uh eye-opening was a learning experience I tried to soak in as much as I could being up there with the, all those vets at that yeah, because you just life. you really just glossed over all of that. You said Tracy Letts, you said all these names, you said all this, all this stuff. You just glossed over it like it was no big deal. And like we all know that, that that's a big deal, especially coming out of school. And you went to school in Champaign, Illinois. Like I'm from Indiana, so I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana. So I know the Midwest. I know Champaign. <laughs> Don't nobody know Champaign like that. So how did you like talk? Tell us for real. How did you go from Champaign, Illinois to Broadway within a year's time? Uh, I think a lot of it was um, not really understanding the magnitude of the, the circles I was being brought into. Waukegan, Illinois, we didn't get to Chicago much. I didn't see, I didn't know anything about Seven Wolf when I auditioned for the first show there. So it was truly about the work for me. And I just sort of was singularly focused on that. And that's been a lesson to me that everything else will come if you're focused on telling the story with your, you know, to the, the full extent of your ability and, and being a open collaborator. Uh, so I think not being intimidated, it's, it, it was sort of an ignorance is bliss sort of thing. Um, I, you know, I sort of knew who they were, but I was really just a new kid on the block trying to do the best work I could do. And I think that served me well. And, and it has been serving you. So after your Broadway debut, what happened within these past 10 years that brought you back to uh, this piece? You, you did do this role of, of um, in Passover in Chicago. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so over those 10 years, because of Superior Donuts, TV gigs started to pick up for me, and I got a couple series regular situations going on, and that sort of uh, took up a lot of my time, but there was, fortunately for me, there's there was a new slot at Steppenwolf that was the summer slot. It was like two months long. That was my whole hiatus from elementary. I played this detective named Marcus Bell on CBS for like seven seasons. 
and there was we would film for 10 months and then in that break i got to do a couple shorter runs at steppenwolf and passover was one of those that we did a reading of it and then we didn't do the production for like a whole year so i was sort of sitting with uh antoinette's first draft of that one of her first drafts of that play and uh communicating with her about you know what i i was wrestling with in the material because people just say you just jump in and do a play it's like no you have to find your way into these characters and these stories to make sure that you can bring what it requires and so i i just sort of grew along with the piece she brought in a new script day one of rehearsal and we just sort of had to deal with that and (laughs) off to the races and so that was that was a big uh, uh, thing for me, being able to uh, oh. shepherd that project, you know. Yeah, so in the midst of developing Passover while you were still on television in on the show Elementary for seven years, you glossed over that too. You've done Person of Interest, Law and Order, Detroit 187, Eastbound and Dawn. So you've done a lot of television. How was it jumping back onto the stage after doing such a different medium um, after so long? So I did have a break. What was the first one that I did back? I did uh, Constellations. I think that might have been the first show back for after a couple years hiatus. And it was one of those plays where you had to, you say, that you do the same scene like four different ways with just little tweaks. So it was a memorization nightmare. And that was sort of like a, a trial by fire getting back into it. And it was like, riding a bike after a while. Um, I, I felt that I was reinvigorated to get back on the stage after spending so much time in front of the camera. It's such a different beast and it's, you know, it's live and you, yeah. you play out the whole arc with no stops. So I, I, was, I was sort of like, uh, I had all this pent up energy, I think. <laughs> yeah. I, like I feel that, um, and, and and it shows that you use that all in your performance. When you um, did do Broadway, and you were nominated for a Tony, was that something that was uh, shocking to you? Were you shocked? What, what was that that experience like for you? Yeah, man, I was just doing uh, you know doing what I usually do try to try to give <laughs> my all, and Tracy was like, you know, you're gonna be nominated. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> and then if it actually happened and uh you know I was in rooms with folks that I never really thought I would I met Denzel during that time, uh saw the way he he moved in those rooms and 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 tried to soak up, you know, everything I could. Uh but you know awards are strange yeah and i never talk about it of, I, ne- I never sort of want to be uh, uh chasing after that sort of rec- recognition because i feel like it's so fleeting and art is subjective and you know there's it, it it's trapped to me um so really it's it's about the preparation and rehearsal and then execution of the work for me and you try to enjoy that stuff. I'm an introvert, not a networker. So those things are draining in a different way. Yes, Um, I understand. I'm I'm learning to be more in the moment and just enjoy people's company and, and, you know. Now, do you have a hard time sitting in compliment? Absolutely. Okay, (laughs) That's that's what I'm receiving here because I'm trying to like, I'm trying to give it to you because, sir, you you're doing awesome work, and as as well as you, uh, Namir, Namir Smallwood. Yes. I've known you for some years. You're in Chicago. You know, you both met at Steppenwolf, correct? Yes. Um, and yes, I knew I knew great. you from Chicago. You did another Tracy Let's Play, which was just just not too long ago. Uh, don't give me the lion. You just did the Tracy Let's Play, maybe last year. He, he just yep. did bug. Yep. The yeah, pandemic bug. shut it down. It was selling out, so they bringing it back. And he's going right back into it in hey. you know, a month, and he's going to kill it again. Of course you are, brother. That's that's what I'm talking about. Stay booked, because you are you are, <laughs> you are are doing it, brother. Like, I saw you in uh, Dominique Mariso's Pipeline, 
And that was the first piece that I saw. I knew you from Chicago, but I never saw you in anything until then. And so when I heard that you were doing Passover, I said, oh, this, this guy, he's got it. This gentleman right here, he's, he's going to bring something. So congratulations on your Broadway debut with Passover. Talk to me That's a little bit true. about that process of taking it from Steppenwolf. Also filming this, this movie for, for uh, Hulu, not Hulu, excuse me, filming this, uh, this movie for Spike Lee um on is it on hulu it is on hulu right? amazon prime amazon prime don't get me to lying jesus amazon prime talk to me about the the process of steppenwolf realizing you're not going to film this this play um and then coming to broadway with it as well this this journey this full circle journey if you will well john could talk about the uh the Amazon Prime and Spike mm -hmm. Lee because I wasn't a part of the Chicago um, iteration. Taping, right. Yeah, I was, was going to be. Okay, so what happened with that, Namir? So I was going to be, I was scheduled to do Passover for like nine months. And I went off to do a play in California, you know, after not having you know, worked in Chicago for like five years, um, being there, living there, but not being able to buy a job. Um, mm. So I ended up going off to California to do Gem of the Ocean. And I came back and I just got a text message um, from the director of this workshop that they were doing this, this workshop of this play called Pipeline by Dominique Mariso. And I was like, oh, okay. So I'm like, okay, cool. And I had heard of Dominique, Sunset Baby, and yeah. one of my mentors, um, Marion McClinton, he did a workshop. Of I love how y'all just be plays. tossing these names out. <laughs> Your mentor is Marion McClinton. Like, what? Like, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> If anybody yeah. doesn't know who Mary McClinton is, a, a phenomenal director, uh, uh, August Wilson Tide, um, just a, a, a titan in the industry when it comes to theater, when it comes to Black theater, when it comes to lifting us up, when it comes to telling our stories, Mary McClinton is everything. Um, so go ahead. I'm sorry. I just had to. I love how you just throw yeah. stuff out like <laughs> Y'all so, killing me. Y'all killing me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I went and did this, uh, this workshop. And it was at Steppenwolf. And, you know, Dominique, she took a liking to me and she took a liking to what I did with Omari in that workshop. And fast forward about maybe a few months, six months or so, I don't know, can't remember. But I got a call from my agent saying, um, there's a workshop, uh, a pipeline in New York that you're being asked to audition for. And I declined because I was scheduled to do Passover. And I was like, no, I, 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 I want to do this. You know, About a month or two later, it came back around. And it was just like, yes, they want you to audition. I was like, no, I'm going to stick with Passover. You know, I gave my word. I've been you know, sticking with this for about a year, you know, so then Dominique, she emailed me and said, do you have time to talk? <laughs> oh, she, oh, she got you. You know, she, wait, yeah. she got away with words. Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> so she poured into your spirit. She said, you're the only one that could do this. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, look, put yourself on tape. Do me a favor mm. and put yourself on tape. And just so my team could see, you. I did exactly what she asked me to do, and I got cast. And I went to Anna Shapiro, the then artistic director, mm -hmm. Steppenwolf, and I was like, look, because I was doing a show um, called Monster at that time, too. And I said, look, um, I just got offered a pipeline that's going to be in, at Lincoln Center. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm from New Jersey mm -hmm. and my family, you know, my grandparents are getting older. My grandmother has dementia. You know, I want them to be able to see me close to yeah. home. Yeah. Yeah. So, so she said, 
that's great. Congratulations. Um, I was going to wait until after Passover opened, but we want you here. You belong here. So we're going to make you an ensemble member. So there's that. I said, huh? Wow. Yeah, just like that. She <laughs> said, so if you, you know, whatever you decide, you know, we, we're going to have your back, you know, mm. whatever you decide. So I decided that I was going to go to New York to do this play. And I went and did that. It was a success. I had a uh, ton of fun. I met a mm. lot of great people, you know, um, that I'm still like really close with now. Yeah. Um, then the next year, I got an offer to do Passover at Lincoln Center. And it was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So yeah, so I mean, that's that's pretty much how that happened. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a and like I said, I, I saw you in Pipeline, and that's how I was introduced to you here in the New York theater scene. Um, so that's absolutely phenomenal. Two things I want to um make sure that I say. One, uh, rest in peace to Mary McClinton. Um, yes. the, the legacy that he has left still feels like he is here. Um, and I do want to honor his name and honor his work. Um, and the second thing is, um, the person that played your role or the role that you are playing now in the yes. uh, Amazon prime version was Julian Parker. I wanted to make sure that I honor yes. his work and what he Absolutely. did in the Amazon prime film as well. Um, gentlemen, so did you guys, you guys met at Steppenwolf. Can you talk to me about your, your personal relationship and how that sort of affected the work that you do with Passover? Bill? <laughs> <laughs> I think we were uh, sort of like-minded in that we were pretty soft-spoken, keep to ourselves. We come to work and want, want everybody to have a good time, but we're, we're pretty much there to work and then we bounce out. Uh, so we did this play called Hot El Baltimore that was directed by Tina Landau at Steppenwolf. Um, Lanford Wilson? Yes. And, you know, it was interesting how I came to that. I think K. Todd Freeman uh, got something else, so he dropped out. I had just finished doing Detroit 187, and Tina was like, you want to come do a play? I was like, hell yeah. So... <laughs> It was new. I just showed up. I usually like was a lot further along in my process than uh, than I was on this because it was sort of a last minute thing, uh, which which was really freeing and fun. And I I was just like, who is this dude, Naveen Smallwood, doing this work? He was so good. You just couldn't take your eyes off him. So creative, and he was working with Alana Arenas. Yes. Queen, Oof. yeah, absolutely. Oh, queen, oh my goodness, she's <laughs> sickening. Killing so anybody, them, David makes man like yeah, she's sick. That's right. So anybody who could get up in a scene with Alana and not get completely <laughs> overshadowed, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know they got something. So I just sort of admired uh, Namir's work ethic and his creativity from the beginning, working on yeah. that project. Yeah, I mean, and that's how it was for me. Like, that was my first show at Steppenwolf, and that was the show that I moved to Chicago with. And I had been hearing about John, you know, for like a couple of years. And I just marveled at how he had zero ego after being nominated for a Tony <laughs> the year prior. <laughs> you know? With like Denzel Washington, and I'm like, this is this is wild. Yeah, you know. And I just, I, I, I really took to how he approached the work because that's how I approached the work. And we never had any scenes together, you know. Mm. So we didn't get to work together until Passover three years ago. So that was, and once we did that, it was just like, oh yeah, we're simpatico like for yeah real. because oddly enough you guys even just sitting here talking with you, you guys have the same vibration the same energy i don't know if that's because you've been working together for these past couple of months or so or over these last three years but the energy uh feels in sync in a, in a um i shouldn't say in a, in a weird way but in a a very um 
warm, uh, brotherly way. Like you guys feel like you are related in some form or fashion, whether it's cousins, you, you feel close. I'll say that. Um, talk to me about this the rehearsal process then and getting to know each other in that and, and matching uh, work because you all seem very disciplined on uh, what you bring and in, bring into the room. Talk to me about the process of this particular work because this we're gonna dive into this piece. This piece is a little, um, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot happening. Um, yeah. There's a lot that can be misinterpreted. Um, there's a lot that can be um, misconstrued. And so I want to uh, really get behind the piece and what you all think about um, the development of, over these past couple of years and, and the message that it's sending. So talk to me about your rehearsal process and how you come into this space um, and how you guys work together. I, it's a lot of listening, and I, I feel like uh, Danya Tamor put together a team that's very communicative and open and places collaboration very high on the priorities list. Um, so she really sort of sets the tone in, in terms of bringing in inspiration and talking about what we're about to tackle and and the given circumstances and and what we need from her as a leader um and setting ground rules about how to approach the work something as simple as if it ain't your line you're not saying the n-word <laughs> in yeah. the room um if there is fight uh, a choreography. Also, oh, that happening. was one of the main questions too that people have been asking. Was she saying the n word? Was she saying nigga in the room? Was she saying nope. <laughs> like that? Not that is all. because people often lean into when they look at at black people on stage, who's directing the work, and do they look like us? And so when you have a white woman directing a play about two black men, um, you know specifically, how does that work? How does that inform the work? How does that uh, uh, change the interpretation. Um, how do you all? How did you all feel about that when you walked into the space and realized that you were going to have a white woman as a director? Was there a, a, a hesitation? Was there anything there that made you feel uncomfortable? Well, I'll say that in Chicago, it was there was you know turnover, and but Antoinette specifically asked for Danya, so I was a bit reticent. But that was because there was a new script that I hadn't seen on my first day. I didn't know anything about Danya. Um, so, I, yeah, I was guarded for a couple of days for sure. But you you can't stay like that if you're going to uh, give your full self to the work. And she certainly um, has an instinctual feel for when to defer to the Black experience and the voices in the, the room. room. She's, yeah. She's there to guide the collaboration, and then when something needs to be set or we need to get specific or talk about whatever, she she's got a great instinct for when she needs to step in and assert herself as the director of the full piece. But I never felt like my voice wasn't actually. This is the most forward in any process that my voice has been. Um, I don't know how it was for you in uh, at Lincoln Center, Namir. I mean, I I agree because the thing that I admire about Danya, being a, a, a white woman, you know, directing, being charged with directing this particular work, she listens and she never stopped listening, you know? And she, not only does she listen, she takes heed to what we have to say, you know what I mean? And you don't find that a lot. You know, yeah. I, I've worked in situations where, you know, you try. It don't to, matter what they look like. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and it's like you try to, you know, say, well, this doesn't feel good, or you know, maybe we should, you know, look at it like this. Well, this is what I look like, and me doing X, Y, and Z, you know, could be misconstrued as something else that you don't intend, but you know there isn't a willing, there wasn't a willingness to see it. But with Donia, there's a, oh, I never thought about that. Okay, well, we'll, we'll come up with something else, you know? And it's just, it's very freeing, you know what I mean? Yeah. To be able to have agency in your own 
experience and, and actually collaborate story. yeah exactly yeah yeah because it, you, you're putting your body on the line at the end of the day exactly um one, one thing i admired about her process was she would you know it was it was tough to not dive into the work right away when we first get there but she certainly put us through like a rigorous uh warm-up workout thing <laughs> followed by sort of creative games to get your uh imagination warmed up as well mm. and like give an example do you have an example of that she would have us do a memory play where you you know she'd give us a prompt and we'd have to go into our actual you know child experience yeah. and and uh, uh basically put on a short play of that experience mm -hmm. together with you know not much time you just gotta oh, uh, she was unearthing some stuff oh yeah yeah and Every it, day. you know some sometimes it was joyful sometimes it, it was dark and yeah uh, that you know I, I think those exercises not only got our imagination going but opened us up to be ready to um explore what we had to explore um and got us knowing each other quickly yeah it got yeah. us to trust you know what i mean yeah. yeah yeah that's beautiful and that's what the work is about the you're also in therapy i know that antoinette talked about supplying therapy for the artists of this show is that something that you have taken full advantage of um especially if you're unearthing some some traumatic things or even some some childhood memories you may for may have forgotten um how is the therapy coming to play for for the both of you I haven't taken advantage of the mental health uh, stipend yet because there was some disconnect. I don't think they were able to refer anybody and mm. maybe for legal reasons or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. I think finding somebody black <laughs> that works with artists on this particular type of, type of work, thing. Yeah. I, I, I haven't found that yet, but uh, even if, I don't find one this week and use the stipend. I think it is something that I'm going to invest in just because I think that's an under researched arena. Like, what are we, what are the repercussions of putting yourself through that sort of men mental, emotional, mm -hmm. uh, physical duress eight times a week? Um, yeah. What about you, Namir? Yeah, I didn't use it uh, for mental health, I use it for like overall body health. Mm -hmm. was, I mean, doing a lot of physical stuff in that play, and it was like, you know, after at the end of every week, it was like my body was a wreck. I'm just like, okay, I need to <laughs> take care of this. So that's what I used it for. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's that's what it's there for. I, I, I absolutely. Um, I think that's amazing though that they, that was offered, um, and. Yeah. And I feel like you two have your own process mentally anyway, because you, you, you know, being an introvert or uh, being an introverted extrovert, if you will, um, as a performer, uh, yeah. you have your own mental process and only own, your own rituals that you have to go through in order to keep yourself together and disciplined. Um, and I think that's beautiful. Talk to me about when you got into the new room, into this room, and there was a new play, and you knew a new ending was coming, but you didn't know what it was. What was that like? Honestly, it was like we had no idea what the ending was going to be. And we didn't get the new ending until what? Tech? <laughs> right about tech. Right before we moved into the space, I think we got it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So And it continued it was, to change. Yeah. Yeah. Tech. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, having that, it's just like we had to tr continue to trust the process. You know what I mean? Yeah. So is that, is that got, frightening? Is that frightening to walk into the space and have new pages that you have to, to, to go on that night and, 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 you know, say like that, because even when I saw the, the, the preview and then I came to opening night, I could definitely tell that, that it would, that it, it was pruned. That there were things that were, that were, you know, moved around, that things were added. There was a, you know, a new song here or there. Um, how, when you're on stage, for the entire play there's no time to go off and look at your book no time to to go and you know pull like is there a microphone is somebody calling the line off on the stage like what how how tell me how please tell me I'm, I'm gonna tell you like I'm so glad that 
the changes weren't like a monologue, you know, like a two, three page monologue, mm-hmm. you know, that somebody had to say. Because had it been August Wilson, you know, <laughs> right. that would have been a different, <laughs> different story, different right. outcome. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it can be a little frightening because you don't know, you know, what's what's gonna happen. Am I gonna remember, you know, what what is what is gonna happen, you know? But Again, it goes back to that whole trust thing, you know. But once we got that ending, the new ending, I felt great about it because it was it, it kind of left me personally as as an as an actor, it left me on a more hopeful note. And I can be a little more energized at the end of the show because when we did it three years ago, it was like you got to the end and it was like, all right, I'll see y'all later. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go. No, gotta go. <laughs> yeah. You don't have no conversation for anybody. You know yeah. What I mean? So so it that the the new ending was a blessing once we got there. You know what I mean? hmm Couple of things. Let me see if I can remember. There there are few joys like being able to execute something you got that day in the show mm. that night. Mm. And I think we've done that a couple of times where we were like, you you know, you get it, you go off, you work on your own. And I feel like the foundation of the play was so strong in our navigation through it. And the changes only made it more clear, mm-hmm. um, more moving. Then it's easier to remember and execute when it's only helping the play. Yeah. Um, so kudos to Antoinette for those tweaks. Um, and yeah, I agree about the the ending having, you know, leaving us on on a, a more joyful in a more joyful space. Um, more joyful, or is it joyful at all? Is it joyful? That's that's the, a, a lot of topics of, of discussion. The topic of discussion about this new ending um, has been circulating our our community, um, and how joyful is it? Is there is there anything unsettling um, for you all in in portraying this particular new ending? Well, I'll say that it's certainly multi layered. Mm-hmm. I know that the Policemen becoming Christopher, becoming humanized and going into the promised land is a sticking point for some people. It was a sticking point for me, but Antoinette explained it to me, um, you know, pretty concisely. She was like, mm-hmm. this is Christianity. You don't have to be mm-hmm. deserving of forgiveness or grace to receive, to receive it. it. Yeah, That's right. what it is. So if this person has purged their evil, they may have done all these kind of things and it may not have been of their own accord, mm-hmm. but it did happen and he is one of God's chosen. So he gets into the promised land. For Moses, the after everything he's been through with uh, Kitsch on the block, it is joyful that he gets to walk into a paradise. And then there's that little warning that makes uh, the play high art to me. Uh, this sort of ambiguous warning that Kitsch doesn't quite make it into the promised land. And what is it that's holding him back? How do you interpret the chains um, from his top 10 uh, promised land list being a thing that entices him to sort of stay on the block? What What, what is it um, that's holding him back? And what does that mean for uh what are the implications for America? Um, I love yeah, hearing me, people's interpretations. Yeah. Oh yeah, like for me, it's like, you don't get to see Kitch make a decision. All you get to see him do is turn around, you know? Yeah. So by him turning around, you know, it's 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 easy to assume that, ah, yes, you know, he's gonna stay on the block because, you know, he, he wants to, his, his his three gold chains 
but also it's one of those things where it's very human because you what we do as humans is we stick very closely to what we know so if we stick to what we know if something if what we know is presented to us and something that is unfamiliar is presented to us we're going to stick with what we're going to try to stick to what we know because that's familiar you know so uh, it, it, it's 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 very 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 interesting you know for me to be able to play that moment because as an actor as a character all i'm doing is turning around but just that one movement has so, so much, many yeah. layers yeah you know and again like john said that's high art <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's not wrapped up in a bow it's not exactly you know, right platter you you got to do some they don't give it to you they don't display right. it to you you have to right. dissect it and, and figure out what's inside and yeah. i love that um do you think there are any blind spots you think that people are missing something i mean people get so wrapped up in maybe one moment they may miss another um especially us as black people we get so emotionally involved and 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 i have to tell you too i saw the play the first time um, and it infuriated me and I came back and I had a visceral reaction and I also was sitting in the middle of the aisle and I could not escape. I could not leave. I told myself, I was like, oh, there's going to be a certain part that I'm going to walk out on because I just cannot see that. And they gave me tickets that were right dead center. So I couldn't walk out of the aisle. Um, and I just tried to close my eyes, but I just had a visceral reaction of, of, of sadness, uh, of hurt, of pain. Um, I purged a lot of feeling that night. Is there something that you believe that people may be missing that might hold a key to um, um, not experiencing so much pain or not experiencing such a, a visceral reaction to the play? Because it, it, it can be um, a lot. It can be much for people to take in, especially when you, you know, are not aware of the piece as a whole or not aware of the new ending. Uh, I don't know. I, what if... What has come to me uh, from black and white audience members is the overuse in quotes um, of the N word. Um, now I think that's changed. Now I think that the grooming sort of helped it in a way, but also it's poetry too. Maybe right. that's my interpretation. And and you're you're dead on. And there have been, you know, people of a certain generation who don't understand that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay. And what I, what I, I had to sit with that for like a, a few weeks, you know, and what I came up with is, no, it's not necessarily the use of the word itself. I think that it's the use of the word in mixed company, mm -hmm. you know, because I feel like some people, you know, they laugh at things in the show, but they don't really know what they're laughing, they're laughing at. Oh, my goodness. The first 15 minutes are so uncomfortable. First 15, 20 minutes. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking around like, what is so funny? Like it, it actually is can be uncomfortable because people think that they're laughing at one thing but they really have no idea what they're looking at or what they're observing and they're just ha he he and ha ha and like what is funny oh my god thank you for saying that because there yeah yeah this, go, ahead, john. go ahead john this play i my heart goes out to a lot of our black uh audience members because just because of what we're talking about, I think it puts them in a really interesting position to be surrounded by white people either laughing at things or missing things. And I'll talk about some experiences I've had after the, the show, which lead me to believe that, yeah, people are missing things. Um, because you're like, as as the minority in the room it 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 is tough to to see these things on stage being laughed at and not know where everyone is seeing the joke where where it's coming from 
um there are times that <laughs> the blackberries come out <laughs> it's yeah. like strawberries blueberries blackberries and people laugh and i'm just like because <laughs> well, it's black, the berry black. That's why you laugh. That's fine. Right. That's so funny. Right. Right. It's the third one, right. Um, right? And there, I can tell sometimes if you know when the character Mister says, uh, "It's just a name," you know, pass it down and pass it down, and there's no reaction. No one's like, "Ugh." I'm like, "Oh, are they getting this? unaware? Are they listening? Yeah, unaware." Right? <laughs> there are moments like that throughout the play where I'm just sort of checking in. It's hard not to notice. Um, mm -hmm. And then after the show, I've had white, you know, this white dude said N word to me, asking like, trying to be like, why is it, why is it used so much? Why did the, these guys use it so much? But like, said the word, and we're like, you, you just watched a play where. My character literally says to the white character, it's not yours. Yeah. And you felt like you could just come up to a black man on the street and like use the word instead of saying the N-word. Yeah. This old lady the other day was like the Ebonics. I couldn't understand a lot of things. I think I just missed a lot of things because of the Ebonics. And do you think you guys could? I said no. <laughs> I don't think we're going to do anything to the script. What would make you think that during the run of a play, the playwright or the actors would change the words to make it more accessible to you, you. as a white person? Well, that's, that is that is Broadway. <laughs> that is what has been done and i think that's why this play coming to broadway is it, it brings um a unique perspective and it brings a different story um it it also um a different it's a different type of storytelling that we don't get as often as we we need to in order to have uh audiences be able to interpret it in the way that it needs to be received and so that's why i'm, I'm just so go ahead i just want to make what it it made something glaringly clear to me that you know, everybody in the audience isn't going to be, isn't going to have the same literacy, literacy when mm -hmm. we're talking about issues uh, around race. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that is a reality. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, it's Antoinette's charge as a playwright to say, well, no, I'm still going to be unapologetic about the work that I put out there. I can't not have these guys behave a certain way or say certain things because of the various levels of education people are coming in with. Right. Uh, so it's a it's a brave thing that I think she's taken on. Yeah, because they 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 have not done that for us for many years. You know, for other cultures or for other uh, walks of life. Uh, right. Your story is your story. It's been it's you interpret it how you interpret it. Um, do you believe? Uh, that those particular audience members and the people that have approached you and said some some things that may have been off kilter how has it impacted you how are you going to walk away from this um what is your perspective of people um yeah how how does how has that changed you well for me i feel like I feel like the older that I'm getting, the more I'm starting to like really understand people. Mm -hmm. And I understand, what I'm starting to understand is that people are who they are. Some people wanna change. Some people wanna change their perspective. Some people want to understand and have empathy for others who aren't like them. Mm -hmm. And then some people just wanna stay the same. You know, so this particular play is just like every other play um, with Black people at the center is a slice of life. You know, now these people, Moses and Kitch, are two people that mostly everybody would just walk away from. They wouldn't go anywhere near them, you know. Um, their language, the way they look, you know, the way they have their hair. You know what I mean? They're a little dirty, you know, whatever. You know, it's like they don't, 
they will never go near them, black and white. You know what I'm saying? But also, they're people. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you can't police, pun intended, how somebody talks, how somebody thinks about mm-hmm. another group of people. You can do your best to try to, you know, get others to act, to ask themselves the question as to why do I feel like this? Yeah. Why do I, why am I scared around these people? You know what I mean? Uh, a white woman came up to me, older white lady, and she said, uh, how does it feel to uh, say the word nigger? I mean, I've never said it in my life. I'm like, but you just did. Just did, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's it's just like, what this play does for me, and this is my second time doing it, it exposes people. Mm. Good, bad, and indifferent. It exposes them. You know, I find myself being exposed. You know what yeah. I mean? Just, you know, uh, having Chris, the Christopher character, you know, being accepted into the, given a pass to go into the, the promised land. You know what I mean? That's tough for yeah. me <laughs> to think yeah. about. For well, a lot a of us. Man, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Especially first. So, exactly. So it's like, okay, well. I was like, Moses, this... what, is, what the fuck are you doing, man? Exactly. What? Why are you telling him? It's worth, like, let him go on, let him find it on his own or something. Find his own way to, to the exactly. problem. But, you know, go, go ahead. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and it's like, you know, that speaks to like this whole idea of going back to you know a world before there were differences you know Mm -hmm. before there was like a a race you know a concept of race and what this person looks like what these group of people look like you know what i mean i don't know if it ever really existed because we're human beings yeah and it's like you know there, there, there is the spirit of Iblis, uh, which was, which is the name of uh, of of Satan, you know, in in Islam, uh, which is the haughty spirit. You know, I'm better. You know, God created human beings. Mm. You know, and He created the angels first, then He created human beings, and then He God wanted the angels to bow down to the humans mm. and it bleeds said no i'm better than him he's made of of clay i'm made of fire i'm better then he ended up getting kicked out of of paradise mm-hmm. you know so we all have that spirit you know within us so i i you know i just try to think that every day of me doing this play every show i'm getting more and more inclined to be a little more empathetic towards people and yeah. to where people are give more know? grace so, yeah exactly yeah so how is it to um how is it to experience uh, uh the the role of of mr um I saw that there was a, a a white woman as the understudy. The 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 I'm very interested to see. Has she ever gone on yet? Has she gone on or, or put in rehearsal? How does how has that been? Nope. Has there been no? Oh my goodness, that would I think that would change the entire <laughs> play, I if you will. But I think it's a mixed up. It's a missed opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that seems so so powerful in and knowing the piece now and and um how how would that change as a white woman um to come in and, and play that role that uh, yeah I, I would love to see i would love to see that um what There's, that what that looks like or what that feels like i think there might be an invited thing on friday uh a run yeah show, somebody better so. somebody better invite me Right, so somebody you know, better invite me. <laughs> Hello, it's at Hello. Look, I'm knocking on the window in in the in the back of the studio. Hello, somebody invite me to. Let me in. Hello, for real, because that that I think that would um, 
impact so much of the storytelling. And I would, I would just be interested to see what that looks and feels like. Um, as much as I am, am traumatized by this play, I still would want to know what that, that looked like. Um, talk to me a little bit about, uh, and this is, we're, we're wrapping up here. I, um, and I thank y'all so much for your time. I really, really, truly do. Thank what you, are you guys man. going to walk away, walk away with? This is the final week. This is the, the end of, of the run and, and possibly the end of your, your time with this show. Uh, you know, who knows? It might, you know, if it goes to LA or if it goes somewhere beyond here. Um, but this could possibly be the, the last time that you do this show this week. How are you feeling about that? And what are you walking away with? I think my mental and physical will be uh, ready to step away from the play uh, after this week. But I'm also, I feel like this is such a rare um, coming together of artists that mm -hmm. I'm really excited to continue to work and tell this story even more efficiently, more movingly, um, uh, uh, and grow as an artist because the, the two guys I'm up there with always challenge me to be better. I think that's such a rare thing. Um, so I'm, I'm really going to try to enjoy that and be in the moment and, and take advantage of it and, and see just how deeply we can continue to, to sink into this story. And, uh, walking away with uh, I've, uh many 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 people have said that it's given them a lot to think about i think the play is sort of a rorschach test like that um so i'm walking away hopeful that it inspires people to investigate what the play brought up for them um not even necessarily thinking that it was a great play i don't i don't need people to think that but if the play did uh uh inspire some more self-investigation then then i'm really pleased about that oh it did it did that <laughs> it definitely stirred up some stuff y'all like, know i know y'all know y'all been talking to people y'all oh, yeah. get i think y'all get more interaction than anybody else because you're in in the play i think people feel more of a freedom to discuss it with you um, because of you are the, the black faces of the of the the play and and when we see our own we'd be like brother what what happened what is this you know what is that so um yeah yeah, yeah. I, I know I know that it stirred up some things for for anyone that saw it and, and that is to be um commended and that we do the self-reflection what about you Namir what are you walking away with um I'm walking away with a little more empathy, like I said before. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take this experience and bottle it up and bring it to my next uh, gig. You know what I mean? Because it's something about exploring aspects of the human condition and then in turn, exploring aspects of yourself that is very cathartic and mm. eye-opening, you know what I mean? So I think I'm a more compassionate person than I was, you know, before we started this process. You know, I, I've had a, a different experience this time around than I did three years ago. You know what I mean? This was the first time that I've ever done a show where I had unbridled joy, you know? And being up there with my two brothers, you know what I mean? It's, it's like the joy of my life, you know what I mean? And to be able to tell this story, to, to tell Kitch's story night, night in and night out, you know what I mean? with all the, the joy that he has and the fear and the terror that he has too. I think that that, that, that is something that is going to carry me through the, the rest of my journey in this, in this 
thing of, you know, in this realm of storytelling. You know what I mean? So that's what I hope to take, what I'm taking away. Thank you to so, so very much. This is very enlightening. Um, I think we needed to have this conversation. Um, I think people will, will, will gain a lot from it. Uh, we want to honor the the uh, the playwright, Antoinette, the black woman that wrote this play, um, being the first out the gate to come to Broadway and and reopen it and and be the guinea pig of what what's what is happening in our in our industry at this time. We want to honor the understudies of you two gentlemen who have to come in night after night and and you know be prepared to go on. And we also want to honor the creative team of this piece um, for all the hard work that they put into it. The set is beautiful. Um, the, the the promised land looks looks gorgeous. Um, the the costuming is done you know well, and I I'm very appreciative of this whole creative team for bringing this piece together um, because I know it wasn't easy, and so we want to honor that. Um, we want to honor you two gentlemen for the work that you lay on that stage every night. It, it is awe inspiring. I will say that. Um, and we thank you. This has been a new episode of Off Book presented to you by Broadway Black. We've hit our mark and we've done it right now. I'm Drew Shade and we out y'all. Thank y'all so much, gentlemen. Y'all be easy. Thank you. You too. Awesome.